Um, hi. This seems cool. Um, yeah, so um, I've been giving a lot of introduction talks to Node uh, in the last couple of months, and uh, it's really nice to come to JSConf and, and be able to make some small assumption about uh, people here knowing what Node is and what it does. Um, so I'm going to take the opportunity to give you some things in Node that are less than perfect and that need to be done. Uh, and to hopefully encourage some of you to uh, contribute to the project and work on these problems. I think that they're all kind of fun and uh, there's a lot of stuff to do. Um, so, yes, Node is gaining popularity. It's, it's, really, uh, it's really interesting and, and fun. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, it, it actually has a chance of becoming a real application platform. Um, and we should work very hard to try to make that the case, or at least I'm going to. Um, so, yeah, I, I hope that this encourages somebody to, to work on some stuff in Node. So, Problem one is the SSL support in, in Node is, is lacking. Um, and it's really unacceptable. Uh, SSL is very much uh, an infrastructural protocol. You almost can't do internet without it. And maybe this wasn't the case a couple of years ago, but these days with more and more websites defaulting to, uh, to SSL, uh, it really needs to be uh, done correctly. Um, and currently, Node has some bindings to OpenSSL, but they're buggy and they're incomplete and they're not implemented in the best way. Um, they're very much tied to, uh, uh, tied into the socket code and should be separated a bit. Um, and all this makes for something that is ultimately unusable. Um, and so, so this is really not acceptable. Um, and so I think probably the most important problem uh, that needs to be done with Node is, is that we need to have really good support for, for client and server uh, SSL. Um, with all these cool features, you know, there, there's a lot of talk about how to speed up, uh, you know, the, the handshake process and uh, some of the new features and that, that you can do with, with SSL. And I, I think that, um, you know, we're, we're kind of starting from scratch with Node, and so, uh, we might want to take this opportunity to see how far we can we can go forward with this. Can can we actually, you know, implement a snap start sort of thing? Even if OpenSSL doesn't actually support it yet. Um, the second most important problem um, is the fact that Node is very much focused on performance and uh, a lot of thought goes into how to make things as fast as possible. Yet, more or less, we're developing blindly. Um, so the, we don't have a continuous integration system for performance tests. Um, there's been some work done in this area to kind of get a website up and have build bots that, that produce graphs, but there was too much noise in the graphs and the, the benchmarks weren't, weren't so effective. Uh, and build bots not, it, it, it's kind of an external project from Node itself, but it, it's really important. We need to know when we make changes if it's affecting a certain part of the system. So at the moment, really the only thing that, that's being uh, tested very often is, is the HTTP hello world server. Um, which is not really important, but basically anybody who comes to Node and, and tries it out is going to open it up and write a hello world server and, and see how fast it is. And 
you know, stupidly base their decision off of that. So we, we should address that point. It, and I mean, a Hello World server does exercise a lot of code, but there, there's other issues. Um, for example, startup time. Uh, it's currently something like 40 milliseconds on my laptop. Um, on the Palm device, it's more than a second. So it, this stuff needs to be considered, and uh, we need to know that when changes are, are being done, that they're not affecting performance. Um, Node introduces kind of some new ideas about programming servers. Not, not necessarily new, but takes them to an extreme level. Um, and so if you've done something with Node, you might uh, realize that you get into this situation pretty often where uh, an event is triggered and you'll get an exception and you'll see your stack trace and it's very small uh, because you're, you're constantly killing your, it's a single step, so you're, you're constantly trashing it all the time. Every, every, every event, you're, you're, you throw it away. And so you get very little context into where errors are coming from. Um, so like this example, um, you have two set timeouts, and you don't know beforehand which one necessarily is going to execute the function f, but one of them does. I mean, th this is very contrived, but you could, you can imagine and you've probably experienced situations where two different events can lead to a certain function and you need to know where it originated from to solve the problem. How do you deal with this? One, one solution, of course, is, is some sort of green thread coroutine, continu continuation passing thing. Um, I don't want to go into that at the moment, but Node is not going to do that. <laughs> um, so, right, you, you might get an error like this, which you know references the fact that there is an exception thrown, but doesn't actually tell you from which set timeout it came from. Um, so, it's really hard to debug. How can we solve this problem? It's not like you know written into the laws of physics that you need coroutines to solve this problem. Perhaps we can think of something else. What if we limit ourselves to, to, this, to this single stack world? Can, can we think of some other ways of solving this problem? Maybe every time you set up a new event, like start a set timeout, maybe you make a link to the previous event that created that thing, and you have this kind of list of things that you could walk back through history to find out where it came from. Um, of course, there, there's other things that can be done with debugging. Uh, V8 has this really nice uh, TCP uh, server that, that it can start up, and you can connect to it and write a little uh, JSON protocol between the node process and your debugger and kind of get information, set, uh, set breakpoints, step through the execution. Um, so uh, you can do this currently with node. You do node dash dash debug, and it will start the, the server. Um, but uh, it would be nice to be able to turn this on dynamically. Um, so maybe by sending the process a signal it would start this TCP server and then you could connect to it and, and do stuff. And the V8 uh, has, has this live edit feature which allows you to actually change the running code. And so I think for a lot of people who are doing uh, frameworks on top of Node that this would be a really uh, useful thing that you could run your, your application at a normal speed and then turn on this debugger, send the changes to the code, Change, change the, uh, send the diffs to, to what you've changed in the code and uh, disconnect and, and have it still running, but at a normal speed. Um, it would be nice to uh, 
hit the process with a signal and get some sort of heat profile or CPU profile. Turns out in Node, uh, one of the things that we learned from, from doing the Node knockout contest was uh, there's often memory leaks in, in Node programs. It's, it's hard to debug where these leaks in your, your uh, JavaScript objects are coming from. It would be nice to be able to just kind of hit your running server and get a heat profile. Uh, D-trace probes. Um, Joanne recently hired Brian Cantrell, who's the, one of the creators of, of D-trace. Um, and so we have plans to, to put these probes in as much as possible. Um, so it would be really nice to get them into function calls so that you could actually, you know, get stack traces on, uh, see, see where certain things originated from uh, with respect to, to uh, JavaScript function calls. Um, but mm, these things seem hard. Um, it seems that, that inspecting the, the V8 heap and finding out, looking, inspecting these objects is probably going to be difficult. So anyway. Um, event emitter firing, possibly some things on the thread pool, just events everywhere so that we can, we can kind of poke at these processes and see what they're doing and, and be able to inspect node processes. Um, the fourth most important problem is Windows, which almost nobody cares about except for everybody, um, which is a bit unfortunate. I certainly don't care about Windows. Um, I just would like to run on Windows. Um, so currently we have a, a SIGWIN port, um, which is, as far as I'm concerned, fine, but Windows people tell me that Windows people don't like that. And so um, <laughs> it would be nice to have a native Windows port. I mean, it, it is a significant user base, and, and it's really, you can't just ignore it. Um, you have to have some story there. And for the moment, SIGWIN is reasonable, but I think having a native, like an actual real native Windows program uh, that ran well would be very beneficial to a lot of people. There's no reason that we can't be doing Windows GUI apps with Note. So uh, it's just that it, it seems like it's going to be very hard. Node is very much a, a Unix program and not a Windows program. Um, and so, in particular, the, the event loop abstraction library that, that Node uses, libbyv, doesn't, doesn't uh, support Windows very well. Um, it seems like this can be dealt with, um, but it, it's going to really require some effort. Um, and it requires somebody who's very familiar with, with Windows system programming. Um, so this is definitely not something that's going to come from me. Um, but I, I, I hope that, that somebody cares enough about it to, to sit down and, and do the work. Um, it would be really nice to, supposedly Windows has a very fast uh, event notification system. <coughs> um, these IO completion ports. Um, it would be nice to be able to use those instead of select. Supposedly uh, libevent2, which is uh, another event loop abstraction library, um, does this correctly. So one possibility is to actually crane lift node off of libev and onto libevent2 which sounds really painful. And LibbyV is just so cute and like, you just really wouldn't actually want to do that, but it is nice that, that libevent2 is, is going through great lengths to be very compatible with Windows. Uh, so maybe it's worth doing. It would be a lot of work. But maybe you don't even care about performance on Windows too much. Maybe, maybe Node could be, I, I mean, nobody's really going to be running servers on Windows anyway. So per perhaps, uh, perhaps select is okay. V8 
V8 has a, has a one gigabyte uh, heap limitation on uh, X64, uh, just recently discovered. Um, so this is, of course, a fairly large problem. Um, I don't think we can expect that processes are going to be under uh, one gig of, of memory. So um, this needs to be addressed. Um, one gig is a, a decent size for, for a program. Um, so I, I don't think we're necessarily going to be bouncing against that immediately. But if people start developing larger and larger frameworks and you know, maybe they're, they're doing a, a little in-memory database or something like that, you would, you would definitely not want this to be a restriction. Um, yeah. Unfortunately, V8 doesn't care so much about this because uh, websites don't get that big. So this, this is some work that will have to be done. It's getting more and more technical if, uh, <laughs> as we go along, so I, I apologize. Um, copying strings out of V8 seems to be a problem. So, so if you do a a little uh, benchmark where you send uh, larger and larger uh, strings as a response. Um, Node's performance degrades really poorly um, with respect to other dynamic language web, web servers. Um, so clearly we're doing something very wrong. Um, and I think the, the, the problem is that basically we're doing two copies. We have to copy the string out of V8 heap into some external buffer and then copy it into the kernel or to the device or whatever. Um, whereas the other people are actu actually accessing the string in the Ruby heap itself. So it, it, something needs to be done here, at least for certain cases. Um, for example, JSON dumps. If we could just be able to push those to a socket a lot quicker, uh, removing one of these, these copies there, I think it would be very beneficial. Um, also, not non-trivial to solve this. Um, so, the current mechanism in Node for, uh, for writing to sockets is every time you call socket.write, or if you're in a web server, you, you say response.write, it maps to the same thing is that it actually executes uh, the right syscall in line in, in, that, in that function. Um, and it seems that this is not the appropriate design. I think what needs to happen is, I mean, what, what, what ends up happening is, is that you call write a bunch of times in one iteration of the event loop, and uh, you end up with small packets being pushed out, which is not what you want. You want them to be bunched up, because within one iteration of the event loop, it's very, very quick, right? The, these writes need to be buffered into, uh, at the end, uh, up until you go to select or epoll or whatever. They need to be buffered up and then sent out in one dump. So Node has this, uh, this watch file uh, thing, which people probably have used. Um, and on Linux, it's really great because it, it actually uses the I notify stuff. And so you actually get an event from the, the kernel to, to tell you when, when a file has changed. Um, but on other operating systems, it's just doing a stat over and over again with some interval between it, which is expensive. And it actually is doing this stat synchronously in the main thread of, of Node. So, um, of course, if, if, you're, if you start watching a file on, say, an NFS uh, file system, then um, that, that can block for an arbitrary amount of time in the main event loop. So th this is really uh, not a good thing. Um, other operating systems have ways of getting events from the kernel. It's not the same as iNotify, but there, there are ways to do this on, on OSX. Um, so uh, this is a bit of work, but uh, not too difficult, I think. Um, 
I think the main problem is that, that uh, watch file references a path and the, the other event notification systems reference uh, file descriptors. So eh, we either have to change the interface or massage it a little bit into, into working. Um, so Node has this, this little thread pool um, called libEIO, which just has a bunch of pthreads and you kind of send it little system calls to do, um, things, that, things that would block, right? If you, if you have to do a, a get address info, uh, you send it to that thread pool and it blocks, fine, but you know, it, it does it in a thread and your, your main thread can keep going and then you get notified back. Um, on certain systems, you do actually have in-kernel asynchronous I.O. And so you don't actually need to do this, this thread pool thing in, in user space. Um, so uh, it would be nice if, if libEIO actually used these, uh, the appropriate things on, on different systems. So um, there, those are my, my nine problems. Uh, <laughs> There, there's a new mailing list um, for, for Node because the other one's getting a lot of traffic that's a lot of newbies. And uh, so if, if you're interested in development, you should, you should join this. And if you're interested in solving any of these problems, of course, email me and we can, we can discuss it. Um, but yeah, it's very much encouraged. Okay, so this is mostly the end of my talk. Um, I also want to announce that uh, Joint is, is having a new uh, release of our NO.DE service, which we did for the node knockout. And so uh, people at this contest can, can go to NO.DE and get uh, a smart machine to deploy node apps to. Uh, this is not our final version, but uh, another release of it. So if, if you go to NO.DE, um, you can register for an account. And there's some curl commands to do because it, in the end, it, it's some REST API. Um, you don't have to memorize these commands right here. But um, go to no.de and you, you can get an account and, and try to push a, a, a node app up to it. Um, and hopefully in the next uh, two months or so, I think we'll, we'll have a, an actual release that uh, we will charge money for. And, will be open to the public. Um, so, yes. Um, so, sorry for the very technical talk. Uh, I hope I didn't bore anybody. But uh, are, are there any questions about anything related to Node? Yes? So the, the question is, should I, will I be bundling a package manager with Node? And the answer is no. Um, Node is more or less how it will be now. Not much more will go into it. Um, and I think it's important to keep it small. Um, and so, of course, there's a lot of work to do. Uh, I've just laid it all out. But it's not necessarily, you know, building a package manager or, doing the, these library or, you know, building a web framework. I mean, it, the, the API that we have now is more, you know, we, we might add a couple of things here and there, but, but more or less, this is what it will be. Uh, not Michael, but the person behind Michael. Uh, the, yes, the... The heap profiling is already in V8. Uh, Node originally had an, uh, the question is about blocking versus async require. Node originally had an async require, but I was convinced by the CommonJS people to change it in the name of CommonJS, so it will be synchronous. Sorry, I couldn't hear you. Uh, 
it, the asynchronous require has always been there. It was recently removed. There will be no asynchronous require. Michael? <laughs> But buffers are outside of V8. Okay. So just V V8 objects. Right. So if, if you're doing like a some sort of database, you should probably allocate a very large buffer and do that instead of a big JavaScript array or something. Other questions? Okay. Well thank you.